Thank you. All right. Uh, good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to January 10th NID meeting. Um, the meeting is now called to order. So join me in Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Uh, Madam Secretary, roll call, please. Division one? Here. Division two? Here. Division three? Here. Division four? Here. Division five? Here. Thank you. Uh, before we have public comment on items not on the agenda, I want to uh, recognize and introduce people to Erika Fernay, who is the president of the board of the North Yuba Water District, and she's here all the way from Oregon House, and Aaron from Circle, you know. Okay. So, public comment for items that are not on the agenda. Seeing none, uh, let's move to the consent agenda. Everybody happy with it? I move to accept the consent agenda. I'll second. Oh. She got it. <laughs> Ricky second. Public comment, please. All right, roll call, please. Division two? Uh, yes. Division three? Aye. Division four? Aye. Division one? Yes. Division five? Yes. Okay, so now we're into the workshop items and modification of position classifications for the IT department. Okay, board, I'll, uh, I'll field this one. Uh, this is Greg Jones. I'm the assistant general manager. We've got John Ortiz in the audience as well. He's our information technology administrator in case there's any technical or other questions that I can't answer and I can have John help me answer. But uh, pretty much a lot of the um, identification of what we're looking to do in the IT department for this particular item is to just do some reclassifications of a couple of existing positions and adding one um, new position to the arsenal of our IT information technology uh, team. Uh, currently, we have a so I'll take it one at a time. Uh, our IT technician is is our um, one. We have one full-time equivalent staff person associated with it as the IT technician. Um, Brent has been here for for quite some time, a little, little not quite a year. Um, he performs most operational technical activities related to customer support for all of our um, computers and and operational. Uh, uh, technology components throughout the whole district. Uh, very, very well suited to help us in those, those environments. Um, this is an, a request to move the IT technician position in from just a standard technician to a one, two. It creates more of a, more of a growth pattern, more of an opportunity for longevity at the district, and it creates a bit more of a kind of a, a, a journeyman level opportunity for that particular position. So it's in line with other techni technician positions within the district in terms of creating a, a one, two position and a growth pattern for that particular position. Um, the analyst position is uh, filled currently by two, um, two full-time equivalent staff positions. Uh, this analyst position was created in uh, 2012 since then, as you can imagine, many uh, IT functionality and opportunities and challenges have arose at the district since 2012. Um, <laughs> and so uh, this, again, it creates an analyst position, which is not just a singular, uh, but, but it creates that journey level opportunity from a one, from just an analyst um, uh, to a one, two position. Um, and so it gives a bit of a growth, it gives a bit of a trajectory, it gives a bit of longevity as well, again, in line with other analyst positions at the district who over the years have just transferred into from an analyst to a one-two and it kind of creates that family of, of positions and growth trajectory. Um, and the uh, senior IT analyst, it would be a new position. Um, it would be as 
more of a well, as all senior levels are, they're, they have they have a supervisory aspect of them um, to a lower level of staff that would be those analysts themselves as well as the technician one two position. So there's a level of of seniority there, hierarchy, a little bit more responsibility, uh, oversight of some highly technical uh, support role and and project work that we would have done here at the district. We don't anticipate. Uh, right away filling this senior level role. Um, we are in the middle of developing an IT OT, which is information technology slash operations technology master plan for the district. We have um, developed a request for proposal. We recently received um, responses from five of the 12 firms that had sent out for, and we're anticipating that contract in sometime in February. But with that proposal and that request for proposal to look at a master plan, we anticipate it to build a, a level of short-term, mid-term, and long-term IT, OT needs. So staffing needs, uh, budget needs, and we'll be creating that. We do anticipate that this senior level IT um, analyst position would be embedded within that sort of future plan for the district. And so as we were developing an IT analyst from just the analyst to a one-two, we thought it would be an opportune time to create the family and just to round it out. Um, I don't anticipate, like I said, really, we don't have an anticipation in the immediacy of filling that. It's possible it could be flown later in the year. We do have budget available in a position that's unfilled, and we don't anticipate filling that this year that's the IT network analyst that was the one that started recruiting last year correct we recruited for it we flew it we realized uh, that um, it really wasn't the most necessary position for us at the time um, and so we really took a step back and analyzed a bit more of the IT staffing and IT opportunities and needs and so we uh, we find that this was really better and that was really when we embarked upon this concept of the ITOT master plan so that we had a much more broad uh, um, sort of multi-perspective of where the IT department um, wants to go in the next three, five, and ten years. So that really kind of sums up my staff report and need. I, if you want to go through specifics about the positions, the red line version, uh, happy to go through those, but uh, that's sort of my my request. And this is a workshop, so this is just a discussion, and we're not anticipating an action at the moment. Uh, if the board approves, at least moving forward, we'll bring this back next board meeting as a consent item, unless you have updates and changes to anything else. Do I ever start with you? I don't. Yeah, I don't have any questions. I it's fairly understandable. Uh, uh, it's an entry level position, right? The, the first one. Yes, yeah. the first one is the technician. It's just essentially making it into a family. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think it's a great idea to add those family concepts throughout the district so that you have, a, you have an entry level journey level. Great. I think it's a great idea. I did have some general questions, but I think that it's probably better saved until you have the time to do them some concept around the master plan because general curiosity about how is our IT department staffed relative to other water districts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly part of the request for proposal that we put out. Uh, that's what we anticipate back. We anticipate a full 360 degree review of our IT department and its relevancy, its 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 relationship to other similar department or districts within our area. Um, so we're going to look at the whole thing. It's basically an autopsy of our IT situation and really understanding security considerations. Um, as you know, back a few years ago, we did have that security uh, breach here at the district. We've done a lot since then to bring us up to speed, thanks to John and his staff. Um, but we do know that we have a long way to go, and it is changing rapidly. The IT world is, is, is the underpinning to so much of what we do. Right. You know, it used to just be pads and paper, right? And and then we'd microfish them in and scan them in, but now it's everything is becoming digitized, mobile, um, security driven, and um, and that is what the ITOT master plan 
really is, is going to be helpful for is to really give us an outside perspective of um, our relationship to that, the, the cybersecurity world and, and its relationship to other districts of similar size and competency of what we are. We're hoping it lays out uh, potential investments that we should make over the next 10 years because we are definitely falling short. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to have just on actual investments on improving the structure, improving the how our staffing structure is, making sure everything's relating together. So I'm really excited to see it when it comes out. And then I don't have we ever um, discussed the ITSIC, the IT Strategic so. Committee? We kind of made, mentioned it maybe once or twice. Yeah, the ITSIC is the IT Strategic Committee, and so that's made up of, gosh, 30, 25 staff-ish uh, from all across the departments. Um, and what we're doing there is we're giving everybody an understanding of the whole district of what the breadth and scope of IT staffing and, and projects are. And so we've got, we have a uh, prioritization list, we have a, a system where if somebody brings a project that is going to take staff time, IT staff time, greater than say 40 hours of work, and we assess that through various means, um, then we bring it to this its committee to really discuss to really discuss its nature, the project, you know, the importance, the priority, the security aspect to it. Uh, does it have budget? And if it if it meets a certain level of criteria and qualification, then we look at the list of projects that the IT department is currently working on, given our capacity and, and scale and scope, and really try to work it into a much broader sort of timeline of when we can do it, and so that everybody at the district, all staff, are understanding and realistic to how that IT department can respond to their needs. I mean, really, you know, the key is the IT department is, is it, its customers are our staff, right? It's an internal, it's an internal organization um, need, and so that ITSKI is a way that all staff can understand, and all departments can really understand the breadth and the scope of, of current capacity, and when we can fit a project in, and if we have to bump something, why we're going to bump it, and and so everybody's on on the same page. So that started, kind of our meeting started late last year, mid last year, and we're meeting as as we need to. And it's also intended to assist with the discontinuation of kind of these isolated IT projects where they might be putting in a system in hydro that doesn't necessarily complement what's going on in water because as we know, moving forward in the future, collection of data is very valuable to the district. So we're trying to formalize some of our methods for developing projects, selecting projects, and prioritizing projects so that when we present them to the board for funding, um, we're getting the most bang for our buck. Just one more thing back to oh, yeah. the master plan, the ITOT. Um, it's specifically separated because of information technology is different from operational technology. So at some level, they intersect. They have to cross a firewall. They have to cross a barrier of some sort into a network, into a, into a tied system with all of our other customer data and all of our GIS and all of our everything. So, so it, I, I, I think we're all looking forward to seeing what this master plan really comes out to be and, and really helps define and delineate some of those um, some of those pathways and those and separation of duties, which is is inherent in any public agency of our size, smaller or larger. There's always a inherent um, conflict or just um, back and forth between an operational technology that is out there that helps with specific operational tasks to our information security and information network technology. So looking forward to that. Yes. Um, it, really just a comment. Um, first is I'm so glad that you guys are taking this on and doing a more formalized plan that will bring it all together instead of onesie twosie, which is what we have been doing in the past. So thank you for that. And then when do you anticipate the timing of receiving that master plan or you know, how do you see that timed out? Yeah, so uh, like I said, we anticipate contracting first part of February. Um, we just received, we put the RFP out at the beginning of December. 
we just received questions from five of the 12 contractors that uh, had responded with an intent. Um, we're giving those responses back. Once we once we contract, the, it could take anywhere from 10 months to 18 months, uh -huh. really, to, to be complete with the final package. But along the way, we're going to have multiple levels of information that's going to come to us, and then to the degree that we can confidently can talk to the board about it and the public about some of the some of it will be security and safety considerations that we don't want to divulge to the public in general. There's going to be levels that we'll be able to bring forth to you um, in terms of you know, elements along the way. Where are we in, in relation to other departments or other districts of our size? You know, are we overstaffed, understaffed? Is it a capacity issue given the amount of projects that we do? Um, they'll come at the end of it basically is a, like Jennifer says, it's a mid-short and long-term master plan that will help define budgets for Wonderful. all departments and our IT department um, uh, over the next, you know, decade. So it could be capital improvement things. It could just be operational budgets. But looking forward to that. So I, I'd say at the, at the law, far end, 18 months, but probably not much sooner than 10. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm. Chris? Uh, I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I'm not a tech technology person. But I struggle. The only part I struggle with is, is um, what level, and I trust that the staff has figured this out. What level, how how well we're doing now, where we're where we're going, and and what what our needs are, and that's a little um, slippery in my mind. But uh, I I fully trust the process. So looking forward to it. We 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 have a we have a very tight, uh, efficient IT staff at the moment that are doing a whole lot of things behind the scenes. That keep this place running, and oh, you know, this is my feeling about that. Mm -hmm. you know, that uh, yeah. Relative to, I've heard the number of IT they have just down the road, uh -huh. and I go, "Holy cow! We're, we're either doing a great, efficient job with the staff we have, and the, and, the, and what we have. Well, yeah. We could be doing which is also true. true. Which is I also true. Thanks. I believe John. it's also true. Without it is knowing true. Yeah. Specific. It's true. Yeah. John. John has a lot of ideas, and and he wants right. to implement them, and. Uh, Currently, the staff is keeping pace with what we need, um, but there, there are, you know, we, we haven't done the investment that, this district has not done the investment that it needs to do in our IT systems over the last 20 years, and that's just kind of how it's been. As, as IT needs have increased and, and all operational and all activities of the district are moving more towards the digital realm, um, we have to start keeping up. And so this is the first step. So kudos to John and his team mm -hmm. uh, for for thinking outside the box and moving forward. And to the and to the other departments. I mean, hydro and operations, their operations folks, operation technology folks are spot on. And you know, it it does take a massive amount of of interest and perspective and cooperation to move everything forward. So. I'm just the one sitting here. <laughs> so John, where, where do you house your data center, your, your servers and stuff today? Is it in this building? It's above our pay grade. Uh, downstairs. That's yeah. the yeah. issue we can't yeah. look. Yeah. 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 yeah, thank you. I'm up here quite often, so part of my boardroom medic. But you, you have a nice jacket in there. <laughs> you, you, you need to apologize for the Dodgers. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> So ask your question again. Uh, I was just wondering where you house the servers today. They're here at the. Do you have enough uh, data center space for adding any um, future looking things for 24 and 25, or is that something you need to consider? We have enough space here, but some of the stuff we are considering is putting stuff into the cloud. Okay. Mm -hmm. Forward. I think the ERP software is probably going to go into the cloud, but um, we have enough physical space here. Yeah. In our data center. Now. Okay. I would just like to encourage that uh, intermediate information sharing with us so that we get, we're following along with what your master planning process is in case we have any feedback. I mean, you guys do a great job, but it, it's still, I, I, I'd like to see us have more intermediate information sharing as opposed to one big 
We can drop that. I think that the way the RFP is just basically formed right now is that there's some natural check-in points. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we're kind of going to do the audit, and it's going to look at actual systems and the, the people structure we have, and then we'll make recommendations. So I think there's some real natural check-in points, so we'll do that. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Great. Okay. Thanks. All right. Well, uh, we'll bring this item back at the next board meeting. Okay. I would call for public comments, but I'd like to remind everybody, workshop uh, rules, you can jump in anytime yep. with questions, comments. Uh, so feel free. It is a flowing discussion. So if that, so now everybody understands that, and that applies to the next item also. Uh, we want a lot of input. So anybody wants to jump in with comments or questions? Okay, see, uh, I just want to say it's going to improve our operational efficiency and security. Uh, last week on financial news, at internet or national financial news, the number one targets of hackers today are special districts. Mm -hmm. That's where they're coming at. John, how many? What? What is it? A, a month? What's our we're special number of number of potential penetrations? Ten thousand. We call them knocking on the door. We get several bad actors knocking on the door. We have we have firewall rules in place to block a lot of that. But yeah, we have a lot. But we get a lot of there's a lot scammers so and from emails mm -hmm. from firewall from the outside. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, good job. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And yeah, it. We need this, and we need it tomorrow. But we'll wait the 10 to 18 months. <laughs> That's right. Long game. Well, thank you. Thanks, John. Okay. So our second workshop is workshop on proposed update to the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan. And is that you, Dustin? I think we'll let Dustin take the lead, yeah. and then we'll jump in as needed. I think everybody has something to contribute. So again, folks, this is a dialogue. If, if um, folks online wish to talk, you can raise your hand. And is that star, star, nine. star nine? And if folks in the room would like to, you just have to walk to the podium so folks online can hear. Um, maybe I'll just introduce with, uh, you know, this, this is a required legal process that the Water Board is going through. Uh, there is a water quality control plan that governs the Bay Delta. And of course, the Bay Delta is a huge geographic area uh, of which, Oops. yep, sure, um, of which uh, we are included in. Um, if uh, law requires that the water board review the water quality control plan every three years, and uh, they are out of date on that. So this is an overdue process. Um, there is also, uh, I think there is, uh, really no dispute as to this, that the uh, state of the fishery, in particular in the Delta itself, is in a crisis. Um, so, you know, something needs to be changed, something needs to be done. And I, I think there is uh, general unanimity in the water and scientific community on that point. Um, where there is disagreement, and what you'll see in the staff report is what to do about it. Um, so this, the staff report uh, proposes a number of different um, alternatives, approaches to address this uh, fishery crisis. Um, I, it, the report is about 6,000 pages. I, I brought my uh, favorite <laughs> portions here in case uh, anybody has really in-depth questions that I need to consult the document. I also, in the agenda packet, is a summary uh, where I just try to introduce you um, to what's in the, uh, the draft staff report. Um, so I, what, what I want to accomplish today is to introduce you to the proposed uh, plan amendments and the alternatives. Uh, that's kind of part one. Um, we also want to talk about, um, in particular, the 55% unimpaired flow standard and what we believe that would do to NID, because we believe there are very significant uh, impacts. And we have been working with uh, the district's uh, technical consultants to help us analyze that. So we'll have some uh, slides to present on that. Um, and then I, I want to touch at a high level about the 
uh, proposed NID voluntary agreement. Um, us and the, that, are, that are close to this, we're trying to get away from the term voluntary agreement. It's now called the Healthy Rivers Agreement, but I'm going to slip up and call it a VA. Um, so uh, that's, that's the task before us today. Um, is there anything that I can uh, dig into a little more in terms of summarizing or introducing the staff report? Yes. Okay. I would just like to have a definition or explanation of the crisis in the fisheries. No, me too. Uh, you know, what, what is the scope of the scale of this? How, uh, you know, kind of how is it manifesting? How long has it been kind of yeah. building up? Some history on What's that. What's the cause? <laughs> well, uh, two different questions. <laughs> You, you, you're asking the wrong person, really, um, and it's. It, yeah, I think there's a significant scientific uh, disagreement as to the cause, or causes, I should say. But um, the l let me let me just give you kind of my view, and I'm certainly open to other folks in the room that are perhaps more knowledgeable about this than me. Um, I, I think there's kind of two categories of fishery crisis. There's anadromous fishery crisis, which is predominantly uh, salmon, and then there's pelagic organisms, things like delta smelt, long fin smelt, those types of things that are that are in the delta itself. Um, there, if, if you were to plot this on a graph, you would see a fairly consistent trend downwards in terms of returning fish numbers for salmonids and then the, the uh, catch numbers for the pelagics. And uh, it in, and this is where I'm going to start getting controversial. Uh, it, it really started once you built the large projects. Uh, once you started uh, restructuring the plumbing in the delta, um, capturing and storing huge volumes of water, and changing the natural pattern of how water entered the delta, you know, the, the hydrodynamics of that, um, and then, you know, shifting that to the summer months and pumping large amounts of water from the South Delta, of course, to the San Joaquin Valley in Southern California. And can you just note what you're referring to as the large projects? The large projects are the state water project, which is predominantly Lake Oroville here in Northern California, and then the Central Valley project, which is um, Shasta and Lake Fol you know, Folsom Reservoir. Um, there are other components to those, but those are the kind of key features here in Northern California. Um, so we have Jeff Minton on Star Hi, um, yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to uh, just to follow up on 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 your comment there, and, and thank you very much. You're exactly right in that the you know the large water projects, they really what they did is they cut off fish passage, but also. Um, uh, we we kind of need to expand our view on this, which is that it wasn't only a California thing. This happened all along the coast, uh, going all the way, all the way up. And so, you know, well over 90, 95 percent of salmon's uh, populations have plummeted. And uh, and so the there are, you know, you can look at this in dollars, you can look at it in cents, but it, that doesn't make sense when the system is really a lot more holistic than that, because those salmon feed fish eating killer whales. So there are. Uh, we have resident killer whales, the J, K, and L pods, who come all the way down to California. And so between Alaska and California, this whole huge salmon uh, habitat, by cutting that off, they're, they're simply starving to death. And so I just wanted to you know, echo um, what a lot of other uh, you know, people and other fish biologists have brought to our attention in the, the, the danger of, of cutting off that population and, and cutting off the food source. And just one final story. I was uh, I, I work for National Geographic up in the up up in up in the waters off of the coast of California, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, British Columbia, and on one of the days we were with one of the pods of uh, of these fish eating killer whales, and um, and we we realized they were probably the fish eating, not the mammal eating ones, and so we put a microphone, it's called a, a hydrophone, underwater okay. microphone down, and we were broadcasting it through the ship, and we could actually hear the clicking and the sounds they were making, and the killer whales heard this echoing through the ship. And it and they it was like a giant karaoke machine, and so they came over and just started talking directly into the microphone, uh, and we could hear that. And so I just want to, you know, kind of bring that perspective that actually the system is a lot more holistic and connected, and and because we're starving these uh, the rivers of of access to places where salmon can 
can you know have habitat for for raising uh, you know fry and having places and good gravels and things like that. Uh, unfortunately, it's going all the way up to food all the way up to the food chain. So thank you very much, and I will stay tuned. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Michael Ross. Oh yes, thanks. Thanks for allowing me to speak today, and uh, happy New Year to everybody in the office there. <clears throat> yeah, I would like to point out that um, we can't really start with the projects. What's called the project, as Dustin as Dustin has pointed out, the the State Water Project and uh, the Central Valley Project. We need to go back to the mining activities that destroyed the fisheries to begin with, with the with with the way in which um, uh, monitors were used to wash the hillsides down and destroyed the fisheries at that point and all the diversions along all the tributaries of the foothills that go into uh, the Sacramento River. And so even just looking at our own watershed, the, uh, the main watershed we have here in the district, the Bear River watershed, we can look at the existing uh, diversions that occur along the Bear River below Camp Far West, Camp Far West itself, and that in relationship to the tribal treaties that were promised to the natives at Camp Far West, and then moving up the river to any other dams that the district operates. Now, all of those, we have to take a big breath and, and realize that our forefathers were responsible and now we're responsible for understanding how to correct some of the uh, some of the problems that occur in the watershed and the bay delta is part of that watershed that is fed by the upper watersheds so i i don't think we should start at the projects uh, the state projects i think we should start before that and understand the impacts that humans have had in the watershed with regards to fisheries and that the water board is our trustee and the Delta plan and the Bay Delta plan is, is more than just this report, uh, draft report that we're looking at today. The draft report just supports the actual whole plan to protect beneficial uses. And so I'll, I'll just stop there. Thank you, Michael. So in response. Well, I just have a hopefully a quick question. Um, how long have we been tracking uh, the fish population and and the data that backs up these issues? And uh, Aaron, all right, got Aaron. Sorry, I'll <laughs> jump in, Aaron from Circle, and kind of see if I can't get very specifically at some of your questions. So to toss out a few numbers, sort of best guess. We don't have written records, obviously, but best guess for the Yuba watershed specifically. Chinook salmon runs were in the 300,000 per year annually. Um, coming back upstream this year so far, it's been a pretty decent year and we're just over 4,000. So for magnitude of the issue, those are kind of the numbers that we're talking 300, about. 300,000 started to go down when? Like 300,000 coming back upstream from the ocean. What year was what, that? What year? Oh, Pre-Anglo-European. Okay. We, you know, we're talking about indigenous tribal records, we're looking at fossils, we're looking at ocean-derived nutrients and tree rings, that, I think that's where that number comes uh, from. So it's a guess, but order of magnitude. But what's the best like uh, records we have? Like how far back do they go? Ooh, we've got accounts, but they're journal entries. There's no true, true. count count until, I don't know, last handful of decades. Um, but that 300,000 number also is very much informed by, uh, you know, the journals of miners and those sort of narrative accounts, you know, where salmon were the trash species that you fed to the sort of bottom of the rung in the mining uh, industry because they were so plentiful, so they couldn't have value um, was sort of the yeah. European view. So for numbers, that's kind of the change. Um, like Dustin was saying, there are a couple of val uh, variables. Rim dams are one. We've cut off 80% of habitat. That's going to change how much spawning and reproduction there is because there isn't as much habitat. And the other thing is the timing and volume of water. And so how that relates to the delta is we have fresh water sort of pushing out of these rivers, all of the major rivers, you know, Sacramento and San Joaquin down there, that sort of pushes and holds the salt water at bay. And so when you think about delta smelt and some of those species that are endemic to the delta, 
there's more salt water with a higher concentration of salts, so meaning not as diluted by fresh water from rivers, that is moving further upstream because it doesn't have that fresh water sort of pushing it out. And so in a lot of the staff report and other places, they talk about these places where salt water intrusion from the ocean is a key and a marker for how much fresh water needs to be released because the communities that live in the Delta are now pumping that salt water up. Um, a handful of months ago over the summer, there was a bunch of news about the same issue in the Mississippi and some of those rivers where there wasn't enough fresh water coming out, and so salt water was moving in and impacting irrigation down in the Delta and impacting all of those freshwater species. The other thing that happens with salmon and other, you know, we talk about salmon a lot, but green sturgeon, white sturgeon, you know, there are lamprey, there are a number of other species that kind of encompassed in that. Um, the other thing that happens is as the adult or the juvenile salmon are making their way out to the ocean where they spend the majority of their life, instead of a sort of gradual change in salinity that they can naturally adapt to, they kind of hit a salt wall that adds a lot of stress. Again, there's a lot of factors. There isn't a thing. It's a suite of impacts. So that's sort of problematic. Um, and then as far as I know, we don't have a good sense biologically. But there is definitely something to the idea that in the winter, those huge flows that historically have come out were somehow a cue to start swimming back upstream. And so when that signal isn't there or when it's switched and we've got extra water coming out in the summer for irrigation power and all of those needs, the sort of those subtle cues, environmental cues for the different life stages, again, of salmon, smelt, of lamprey, of sturgeon, get a little confused. And so that kind of thing has been documented for a long, long time. You know, we've known that this is an issue for, you know, many decades. Um, and, you know, it, yeah, it continues to be a challenging problem to solve. So that's kind of a little bit of history and some of the sort of specifics of how we know it's healthy and what are some of those things, big picture, that are driving that unhealthy uh, ecosystem or out of balance, perhaps, ecosystem, the Delta? Thank you. Aaron, could you? Yes. Any questions? No. Well, I, I, I don't know if I'm not going too far afield, but I'm curious what the then the next stage impact is to the ocean as a whole. So you have. Uh, specific impact to the salmon and other species that you've identified, mm -hmm. but then is there even a broader impact to the ocean's uh, environmental balance in terms of how those creatures feed other creatures? And, uh, yep. Yeah, certainly. We, I mean, we heard about orcas. That's a, you know, a big one that we hear about. You know, it doesn't, I don't know, make the news in California the same way it did it in my dissertation in Oregon. And, and we hear, you hear about orca as much as you do salmon, it seems, at least especially recently, because of that connection. Um, you know, there's nutrients that are coming out of rivers that, uh, you know, dams block, they trap sediment, uh, you know, it's not a secret. Um, and so that, you know, that's a challenge. Uh, it, it is all connected. And I would say that rivers in the ocean are more connected probably than we even realize. I mean, our ability to study and monitor and understand those connections gets better all the time. Um, but I am sure it is still more complex than we know. Thank you. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I got four items. Okay. <laughs> right. I, I We're going to have to pay Aaron. <laughs> <that time. laughs> no, I, I, I'm willing to do this. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I shut He's up. always very helpful <laughs> to us. Yeah. He sure is. So, on. Some of the, okay, in like about 2010, 2012, mm -hmm. one of the San Francisco paper examiner or chronicle did an uh, investigative report stating that the California fisheries were producing genetically inferior salmon. Mm -hmm. That's still the case? Has that been corrected? Or how much impact has that had on diminished returns? So I am, a, I am an academic, and I, I struggle to not talk about the well margin of errors and unknowns and that kind of thing. That article, um, I'm not familiar with the specific article, but in general, one of the solutions that we as a society tried as we realized that fish pot numbers were declining and that, you know, dams and the plumbing was a big part of that and a very obvious part of that, one of the big solutions that we tried was fish hatcheries. We tried them everywhere. 
uh, it's really easy to take a male and a female fish and get incredibly high fertilization. You know, in the natural world, you're going to have a few thousand eggs and a couple of them are going to survive. So really no low numbers. If you do that in the lab, you know, all of a sudden you've got massive fertilization, incredible success, but you lose genetic diversity. And uh, you know, if we go back to that kind of high school biology, genetic diversity is key to the success of this, to the species. So my guess is that that article was saying, hey, this whole fish hatchery thing, limited genetics, you know, we all sort of know the issues with uh, inbreeding and similar genetics continuing to breed, that doesn't create very effective or robust fish populations. Um, so my guess is that's the issue. Did it contribute at some level probably is it a key source? I don't know that I would go that far. You know, are you know are fish better than no fish, even if they're genetically inferior? That's I'm not a biologist. I don't know that I'm qualified to get into that debate. Um, it's hard to quantify. Hard to quantify. Is it a straw? You know, as we talk about, you know, all of the different factors. Is it a straw? Sure. Um, I you know how big it is. I wouldn't I wouldn't want to say. Okay. And then there's non-native competitive fish out there eating the salmon how is that hard to quantify also that is also hard to quantify. it's also hard to quantify it's something that I'm actively seeking money to better understand in the Yuba um, and so stay tuned there maybe in a few years I'll have some information for you there absolutely uh, you know non-native but and also and native competitors are an issue you know as we limit habitat there's more competition for resources. There's more competition between salmon for resources. You know, you've got to fight harder for the limited supply of spawning gravel, rearing habitat, bugs, that kind of thing. And that's certainly an issue with non-native predators. You know, striped bass are like kind of the big one in my world recently. Um, we know they eat Chinook. We know that places where there are high concentrations of that, it's a little harder to swim through. You know, you can sort of imagine if there's a, a bunch of predators it's harder to get past them versus if they're spread out. We also know, though, that they've been around for quite a while. It's not like this is a new thing. The striper and shad have been in this system for a long, long time. Um, and there seems to be some sort of an equilibrium, whether it's more or less than without those species. It's hard, those non-native competitors, it's hard to say how much that would change if you could sort of wave the magic wand and remove them. Um, but also, yeah, certainly a contributing factor. Something, and you both so, stay tuned on that one for you. Yeah, 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 fingers crossed for some funding. <laughs> Good. Uh, yeah. Josh, can I follow up on that statement yeah. about the non-native fish? Because that's yeah. what my, my, we hear a lot, uh, and we're involved in habitat removal and water uh, diversion, of course, and that's our, that's what we're here about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> However, I've heard that 98% that, uh, of the salmon are eaten by striped bass in some rivers. Okay. Uh, and these are non-native fish. Is this true? They were not. They were imported in the, in the gold rush era to increase the fisheries for food production. That, that's the history I've read. Okay. I don't I... know the science behind that at all. But that, that was my number one question. That that we're hearing a lot about just dumping more water down to solve this problem, and not nobody's saying let's get rid of the non-native fish, including yeah. delta smelt. Is that correct? The delta smelt is a non-native fish. I don't believe so about the I, delta smelt, I, but I, I'm, it is. I have so, no idea. So so I'm I'm really concerned yeah. about us wholeheartedly taking care of delta smelt when they were an introduced fish by gold miners, and uh, and I don't know that. I'm probably broad brushing. Yeah. But my point is that I think as a whole, we have to take this as a whole, that if that's one of the problems, then then that's implicated as well as us diverting water or, or damming rivers. And uh, anyway, that's my yeah. question and my, and my comment at the same time. I haven't, I can, to, to the question about um, striper predation on Chinook. I haven't seen anything that puts it anywhere near 98%. If you, I'd love to see it if you've got it. I've, yeah, I've been trying to find resources, and I've seen um, some papers. I've found a couple of papers that I'm happy to. Uh, you know, maybe I'll pour them to Jennifer, and she can kind of distribute. Uh, sure. But a paper looking at the Stanislaus and um, the tributary to the Sacramento that I'm drawing a blank on. Understand. 
I don't. I haven't seen anything on the set. Merced doesn't mean there weren't studies. The Stanislaus and a couple other places that looked at it, and it was certainly predation, but it, there was nothing that made me sort of gasp and say, "Holy cow, this is a problem." But again, doesn't mean there aren't solutions, right? I've have heard conversations about maybe again in the Yuba, maybe there's you know options where we change fishing regulations for some of those you know, advocate for the change of fishing regulations for some of those competitor species. Um, but yeah, you know, that, that is part of the solution. I think of myself very much as I get as many people in the room as you can and work towards solutions knowing that, you know, compromise is how you get there. And yeah, trying to eliminate to the best of our ability those competitor, non-native competitor species is it absolutely a part of that. And whether that's changing fishing regulations, you know, fortunately for striper and salmon don't like the same habitat. And so, you know, we removed striper habitat at the Hallwood Restoration Project <laughs> three years ago now. 2020 was the first was that mm -hmm. year. And striper predation went to zero. We haven't seen a competitor in that area that we removed the habitat. So that kind of opportunity as well seems huge. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so, predation, I mean, recreational fishing, sport fishing, how does that account for decline numbers? Well, none this year, it was closed. Um, but, in, and again, in general, sure, fishing is, uh, you know, that removes a fish from the sea, from the, you know, genetic pool, so that there is one fish lost, or however many they catch, right? But in terms of magnitude, the number of fish lost, you know, if we think about just sort of pure mathematics, and I'm going to talk about rim dams generally because that's the easiest one to kind of visualize scales of impact. If we think about however many few thousand of fish, or well, start this in a different direction. If we think about the full Yuba River and we take that 300,000 number as a ballpark number, and we say, okay, there's a rim dam, we've cut off 80% of the habitat, that's 80% fewer fish, right? And again, this is ballpark numbers. This is a general way of thinking about it. That's a big issue versus if we imagine that 300,000 number and the commercial fishery takes, I don't know if anybody here knows what, you know, a good year of the salmon fishery 10 years ago, 20 years ago was, but tens of thousands of fish, again, making that number up. You know, it's really, it's sort of different orders of magnitude of impact. Um, so, I, you know, I think that paying close attention to commercial fishing is also an important thing to continue to do, um, but we have to also have healthy ecosystems. It's right. going to continue to decline if there's nowhere for them to reproduce. So, what you, if I'm hearing it right, is that the numbers are getting so low that it's in crisis. Yep. Um, it would say to me then even cut off recreational fishing with catch and release because there are estimates that up to 30 percent of caught fish that are caught and released will soon die um you know that kind of i i'm happy to have that conversation i don't in this moment know that i have enough information to know those numbers i mean i know in the yuba you know you can't even fish for chinook is the species we're talking about you can't even fish for them and so you know that impact is so non-existent should be none, uh, you know. Um, and in the ocean, I don't have enough of the ocean fishing rigs in my head to know what that would look like. Um, but could it be part of the conversation? Should it be part of the conversation? Probably. Sure. But again, smaller order of magnitude in terms of impact than, you know, 80% habitat loss and nowhere to spawn, rear, that kind of thing. But we don't know if 80% is equivalent to 80% loss. Right, no. I, but we need those numbers. But we, yeah, we need those numbers, and one could argue that the 80% loss of habitat from rim dams uh, had an outsized, has a larger impact because spring run especially, which is the species of most concern, didn't actually spawn in the lower Yuba. They followed winter flows way up and were up spawning and rearing by Downeyville. And so we're forcing two species that historically didn't have to compete with each other to compete with each other. And so, you know, the true just acres of habitat is probably actually a little bit um, generous. Yeah, I see. 
Yeah, get him in. <laughs> I just want to make sure you didn't forget about them. Yeah, yeah. no, I mean, this is great to have a. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you so much. I have another question. Oh, sure. Yeah. On the subject, on the on the whole subject, uh, which, in your view, is more uh, critical: the habitat loss or the loss of water right out of the earth? Water is habitat. I mean, fish need water to swim, and so acres of habitat are are part of it, but. If they don't have anywhere to swim, if they don't have, if they can't make it to the ocean, if they don't understand how to get back up, or those salinity barriers are too steep, you know, it changes from fresh to salt water too fast. It it doesn't matter, you know. Again, I'm, I'm a Yuba person. I know that. Um, Circle's done uh, two hundred ish acres of habitat restoration so far between the Hallwood Project, which is the sea back and Longmar, which is us, and then we've got another neighborhood of fifty that we should have done in the next couple of years, and we keep looking. But we, you know, that's not an option in every river, and so is it part of the solution? Absolutely, but <coughs> without water on floodplains, without water flowing out the delta and all the way to the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, we're restoring water, we're restoring habitat that's never getting wet. And so it's, it's not going to be as effective as it could. Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Don't go away, Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Get some go too far. Rich, you have two hands on mine. Yeah. yeah. Wait, we've got one. Sorry. Two have, now? Yes, there's been two. I just have a short question. Um, yeah. I went to the State Board public hearing on December 17th. And there, there was a very interesting presentation from East Bay Mud, um, and I was wanting to hear if you guys were aware that East Bay Mud uh, did a interesting workaround with, with salmon, tracking them over the over the rim dam and tracking them back, and they had the, and lots of habitat restoration. They did increase the flow somewhat but not in a dramatic way, and they had dramatic increase in, in returning. So they were arguing, uh, at the public comments, they were arguing um, to the board, there are more ways to improve uh, fish life and fish numbers than, than only flow, and it's, it's quite a success story, so if you guys are aware of it, um, I'll hear it in the Columny River. And if you're not, let's talk about it. Thank you. And then, right. sorry, kind of just want to address the Delta signal. Um, Peter Burns checked the California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, website, and Delta smells are endemic to California and unique to the estuary. So non Earth, they are native. They are native. Huh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. All right. That. Well, uh, we have two people. Michael, um, thank you for waiting. Oh, yes. Thanks a lot. Um, I really appreciate um, uh, my director's uh, comments about the maybe some more information about the interface of fresh water to ocean waters. And so I got to step back there. I know we've been through a lot of discussion uh, since that, uh, that that first question by Karen. But, um, um, uh, you know, uh, I studied this when I was the desalination expert for brackish and ocean waters for the state strategic planning called the state water plan. I did that for five years. And in my studies and historical um, research, um, I think I'll put it in this context. Everybody here should probably know about what the inland sea was um, prior to um, Europeans coming here. And the fact that fresh water inundated the Central Valley uh, or the great Sacramento Valley here in the north part and actually encircled the Sutter Buttes at some points. The receding, okay, the receding of that freshwater inland sea, and then it turned to bra more brackish as you went towards the Pacific Ocean and the, and the San Francisco Golden Gate. Um, that was essentially the rearing habitat of the fishery prior to its alteration. So you have to start there with unimpeded flows. And that's not where we're starting, but that's what the history tells us. And so there's a lot changed since then. We've straightened out the rivers. We put levees on them. We've dammed the tributaries. We've done a host of things that have changed that landscape. So let's just start there. All of that is gone for rearing the fish. There's 
direct accounts, multiple accounts of the ship captains making note that they, as entering at times the San Francisco Golden Gate, they could dip their buckets into the water and obtain fresh water, fresh enough to drink and to use for cooking for food. So that freshwater plume that rushed out of the estuary and changed the dynamics of both flow and brack uh, and saltwater content of the estuary is what is drastically changed by the the diversion and storage of water. Um, the and I'll finish up with the fact that there's accounts and scientific evidence and accounts that that freshwater plume reached all the way out to the Fairlawn Islands and supported not only fresh fish or adronomous fish, but the ocean fish and brought sediments and nutrients that were used and exploited by all the creatures of the sea and the bay. And in fact, that promoted the fishery and the shellfish and everything else that the, the Native Americans used in that area to live. So I, that's just a short history of it. So we should really understand that before we start talking about how how we've introduced um, you know, species like the bass and stuff that are eating fish and doing all this other stuff. We really need to go back to understand what it was, what it is, and how we're going to go to the future. So. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Chris, shoot. Good morning, everyone. Chris, Chris Schutz for the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance. I wanted to, um, clarify a couple of things uh, in response to things that have been said before. And then I wanted to point out a few things that might take this in a different and perhaps more positive direction. First, um, Delta smelt not only are native, they're exclusively native to the Delta and the Bay and the Bay Delta estuary. And they were the most prolific, um, what are sometimes called forage fish in the Delta uh, historically. So they've gone from the most to, in the last six years, they haven't recovered any in the trawls that they do in the in the fall and winter. Um, regarding East Bay mud, East Bay mud is kind of the exception that proves the rule. East Bay mud has a very successful hatchery program. They support the McCallany River hatchery. Um, and many, the fish that are moved by trucks are hatchery fish. Um, in some cases, they've actually captured in critically dry years, some of the native fish brought them back to the hatchery and then trucked them either to Sherman Island, which is at the bottom of the Delta, the bay over by San Quentin, and in some cases, uh, directly to the ocean. Um, this is really possible on a wide scale because there's a hatchery and you have enough smolts to, to make this work. On the Yuba, we don't have a hatchery. Um, in many other places, you don't. And, and one of the reasons the McCallany has been so successful has been because of this forward thinking but limited um, program. Many uh, One of the reasons East Bay Mud has decided to do this is because their fish, which are as close to the ocean as can be, uh, directly east of uh, the main part of the Delta, the McCallany Daylights into the Delta near Jersey Point. Not a long way to go. <clears throat> Very poor success of volitional outmigration. They're not being trucked past the dams. They're being trust, trucked from the hatchery to the bay and the ocean. But I'd like to turn your attention to a different issue and how the... Um, uh, the the draft staff report modeled um, the the uh, the implementation of the percent of unimpaired flow. If you look at Appendix A one on page A one seven, it says that the way they modeled it was was um, based on the assumption that all users in the watershed whether upstream or downstream would be responsible for contributing to the new model in-stream flow requirement. And I'm reading from this. However, a proposed plan amendments may include a requirement only at the bottom of each watershed 
that could require upstream users to contribute more or less than downstream users based on specific water rights priorities. Um, and what I don't understand, um, and I suggest that you think about, is, is why NID and the other upstream diverters are, are not advocating um, that their contribution um, either be based on priority, and you all are senior to the folks downstream for the most part, or based on need or public trust resources so that um, the upstream diverters don't have to contribute as much or at all to the outflow requirements. Um, the idea, I think, has been sold in the water user community that you're all going to share equally. Um, my own view is that that is not particularly equitable. Um, it's, it violates the rule of priority. And um, there's not really a public trust reason because you don't have salmon and other uh, anadromous fish um, in, in, that are affected directly by your operations. Um, uh, there's no public trust justification for violating the rule of priority. So I think you ought to think about the fact that this is just one way that um, it, it really for simplicity, that staff, board staff modeled this, but you all could think about modeling it differently. Um, and you might have a different requirement. I mean, think about it. Um, on the one hand, uh, uh, Mr. Whittlesey at, at one of the state board workshops suggested, why am I the only one who has to do it? Now you all are saying, well, or operating on the assumption that you'll contribute what he does. He has a much larger watershed to pull from. Um, he um, has very different needs. Um, as you all have pointed out in some of your filings related to the biological opinion for the lower Yuba River, um, you all, uh, uh, a lot of the water that, that, YCWA uses is sold out of basin. It's not used locally. Um, so there are a lot of different um, considerations here that you all could make. And rather than piling on to a voluntary agreement solution that honestly is just not enough water, um, you might be thinking about how those different responsibilities are allocated. Um, and and certainly, if nothing else, that ought to be one of the threads or contingencies that you consider, because um, um, in the long run, if this voluntary agreement thing goes through, um, it's not it's just going to delay and and account for further degradation of the fisheries downstream because it just isn't going to solve the problem, and you're going to be back here in a while. And it may you may be in a in a in a worse situation. One other thing I'd like to point out is that is that alternative six A that was proposed in the um, in the draft staff report would limit uh, would have increased flow requirements for new diversions, um, and that might affect or might not um, uh, any plans that you all had to build a new dam. The idea that the way the board staff framed it was we need to protect the water that's there, um, which kind of makes sense. And so if you're limiting how much water is going through the Delta pursuant to a voluntary agreement, if people are coming and adding a lot more new diversions that aren't being taken into account um, by any of the requirements that are put in by the voluntary agreements, you're actually losing water. If they build sites reservoir, for example, that wouldn't be online. Um, it might be in line by the end of the VAs um, or if the VAs were extended. But there's a concern on, on the part of board staff and it's legitimate that um, what one hand is giving, the other hand will take away and may take away even more. Um, so you ought to consider that portion as well, that um, it's one thing to consider your um, uh, existing uses, but if you seek to sort of make up the difference by adding new storage, that may have different rules than, um, than existing uses. 
So thanks very much for the opportunity to just sort of put these ideas in front of you. And um, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Any questions? No, but I, I very much appreciate your perspective, Chris. And um, I think that we will definitely consider that in our response to the overall strategy. Because what you said, from my hearing, makes sense. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Yeah. If I could just add um, one thing that Mr. Schutz said that resonates a lot with me, and it's a sort of a point of frustration specifically related to the negotiations for the new FERC license, is that there's um, fairly significant flows in ID would contribute underneath the new FERC license. When you compare the post permit flows contributed by NID versus Yuba Water Agency, one thing that comes to light is NID will end up on an annual average basis having an unmet demand of 25,000 acre feet, whereas Yuba, once their new permit goes into play, they will have an increase of water supply or water storage of about 25,000 mm -hmm. acre feet. And what this means is that they're essentially getting the benefit of our in-stream flow requirement right. as opposed to it benefiting the environment going out, you know, under the Golden Gate, as we've heard, um, which seems to be counterintuitive mm -hmm. to the water rights priority system. So I do think that that in particular is a valid point. And we have brought that to light in our recent FERC filing for the additional information request. As we yeah. should. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, so, if I may, <laughs> <laughs> we uh, haven't got past the date on the memo. We, we, yeah. <laughs> so we've talked about the, the fishery crisis. We've talked about you know the multifaceted causes uh, of the fishery crisis, and Chris uh, did do a good job of introducing us to you know some of the uh, ideas uh, on a solution to this. Um, and, and absolutely, uh, adherence, whether it's uh, an unimpaired flow regime or something else, adherence to the priority system is essential. Uh, it's, that is the cornerstone of our system. It ha has been since California became a state. So that's just incredibly important. Um, I, I would note that um, this is at page four of my summary. Um, there, is, there is conflicting narrative about is this going to be implemented in reverse order of priority, meaning the juniors mm -hmm. would contribute more and you know meet the unimpaired flow requirement before it, it became an obligation of the more senior parties, uh, or is this um, an obligation on every, every water right holder regardless of priority? Um, so there's some conflicting narrative that I point out there at page four. And I will also note that if you dive really deep into the modeling, the, the model is called SACWAM. Um, the, the way the State Water Board modeled implementation does not follow the priority system. So um, hmm. it's unfortunate. So, but but uh, Chris's point um, is a good one. We would absolutely expect that if it was an unimpaired flow standard, it would be implemented in reverse order of priority. Um, Say that again, because you yeah, fade it would be implemented in reverse order of priority. Right. That would be our expectation. And and if it wasn't, I, I will tell you, uh, and many of the the water lawyers have this same fear. If implementation of unimpaired flow or whatever the alternative is, if it doesn't follow the rule of priority, it's likely going to kick off an adjudication of right. the entire Bay Delta system. And you know that that is really um, in my view, a, a nuclear option. It would mm -hmm. be a very costly, very time-consuming consuming process to adjudicate the relative priority of every single water right. We're talking thousands in the Bay Delta watershed. Um, and it's really this neighbor against neighbor, you know, Hunger Games type scenario right. where it, the, the lawyers would win. I mean, my, mm -hmm. my grandchild would probably still be litigating that case. Um, but but I don't know you know how the the communities that have developed around the priority system, including 
our community here, I don't. I think they would suffer for for many years in that process. So, I at least in my view, that's something to try to avoid. Um, so uh, the the. So I had a question for you. Yes. Quick. Any other questions on that? Um, so yeah, I did talk to somebody who is working on water rights at the state. Indicated it might be in order of allocation. In order of allocation or priority. 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 Yeah. Water priority. right priority. Priority. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So hopefully they they stick to that. Dustin, isn't there also some talk about restructuring the whole water right system itself? Yeah, yeah I, that's <laughs> that's been more of a, uh, a legislative discussion. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and again, it depends on who you ask. I think some some folks would really like to see fundamental changes to the priority mm -hmm. system. That there's some inequalities uh, built into it. Um, you know, a lot has changed since 1850. That's and right. And uh, many of kind of the the uh, essential rights, uh, the the water rights that many communities, including this one, hold on to, originated not too long after 1850. So, uh, you know, that is. That is a perspective that is out there. I, I do not share that. My my personal view is that the water right system works. There are um, tweaks that can and should be made, um, and whether that's through the legislature or whether that's through um, leadership of the water community, such as NID, or or whether that's through regulatory action, such as water board. Um, I, it may be all of those or some of those, um, but things like uh, enforcement. I think enforcement of the priority system is very sorely lacking. I think there are flagrant abuses, um, and there was one very, you know, somewhat notorious example now up in the um, Shasta, uh, Klamath? Klamath, yeah, Klamath area, uh, Siskiyou County area. Um, where it became a business decision where some diverters just would prefer to pay the fine because right. it's cheaper right. <laughs> than it is to, yeah. you know, uh, adhere to a curtailment order. And I just think that that's really bad. Uh, something is broken when it's a business decision and it's a better one to just violate a curtailment. Um, right. that, that We need to fix that. Um, so... It's it's but but to me that's a tweak that's not a fundamental change mm -hmm. to the system. So, um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe maybe building on Chris's point, I, I do want to pivot a bit to talk about unimpaired flow in a headwater region, which is which is mm -hmm. NID. Just what we um, I think unimpaired flow as a concept. You know, it may be able to be workable when you have alternative supplies. You know, if if I'm sitting on the valley floor and I have access in many years to surface water, or alternatively groundwater, or I have a, a plumb system where I can purchase water perhaps from others that, um, you know, some kind of market transaction. In other words, I have options. Um, I don't see that same level of flexibility for someone like NID where, again, you're in the headwaters, you do not have a reliable alternative water source. Um, you, we don't have uh, an aquifer, um, at least uh, we have a fractured rock aquifer, but it's, it's not a reliable one that NID could utilize to provide water to its customers. Um, we, since we're at the top of the system, we can't um, save for uh, an acquisition from PG&E, which on an, on an, in an unimpaired flow regime would probably go away, but we can't, what I'm getting at is we can't purchase water from somebody from upstream from us. Else, right. So right, right. To, be, to provide unimpaired flows for the state. So if you, if you unimpair flow the headwaters, you could very easily make a mistake, mm -hmm. and that mistake could be very, very costly because you just can't replace that water. Um, and then you layer that reality with climate change and the, the, the fact that we're going to have a declining snowpack, which is a huge reservoir that, you know, NID has relied on for over 100 years, that is going away. Um, there's just a lot of complexities 
and a lot of enhanced risk, I would say, uh, with an unimpaired flow regime in NID. Now, let me pause there. I think, Aaron, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, I've just I've, I've got a question um, for you. When I think about, you know, somebody making a decision for how much water goes downstream, it's going to happen in one of two ways. It's either going to be a percentage of what is available, which in my understanding is percent unimpaired, or it's going to be in units of physical volumes of water, acre feet, thousands of acre feet, whatever. But thousands of acre feet is still a percentage of what is available. And so are, are you saying that you would rather see a regulation that is X thousand acre feet in this water year type, X thousand acre feet in this water year type, whether it falls as rain or snow and something that is a physical volume of water that's preferable from a management standpoint to a it's X percent, however it falls. That's how the in-stream flows are for the 401, sir. It's yeah. based off a of water type here. And exactly. the reach in, but exactly. it's a volume. But it's, so, and so from a management standpoint, a volume is preferable to a percent of available. Well, anytime you're trying to operationalize something, certainty is better. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. but, if, but the way unimpaired flow is modeled Mm -hmm. Including for NID, it's yep. on a seven-day running average. Right. Yeah. So it, it's it's not modeled as a block of water. I know that's been discussed at times yes. and thrown out there as maybe that's a, an approach to implementation. But at least the way it's modeled, it's a seven-day running average mm -hmm. of you know fifty-five percent at point of diversion. Right. Right. I just wanted to yeah, it was a, yeah a question. I just wanted to clarify in my mind that a physical volume of water is better than a percent, regardless of what the percent is. You know, if somebody, you know, somehow we decided to figure out how to invent water and said, ah, NID only has to release 5% unimpaired flow, unimpaired flow is harder or worse from a management standpoint than a volume of thousands of acres and units of acre feet. Yeah. We have Michael. That's a good point. Uh, thanks yes. Thanks for holding, Michael. All right, thanks. Yeah, well, wh what I'm hearing is a perspective based on the existing water right priority uh, rule. And that perspective, that priority of water right relief, it seems like we're you're you're trying to relieve yourself or ourselves uh, from in, in its ranking some type of responsibility for stewarding the watershed so that the oldest people who are taking water, the, in the right system, the, the like like NID, somehow doesn't have a primary responsibility to actually steward throughout the watershed. This simply not good leadership. You're not showing good leadership when you say, "Well, we've done this for so long, and we're first and right, first in time and first and right." And so we want everybody else to go out and play and sweat, but we're not going to do it until we have to. And so this part, this this part of leadership, I'm just telling you that from my perspective, all perspectives are welcome here. That this is not good leadership. And so, uh, just think about that. Uh, it's not, you know. Anyway, that's my perspective on it. So, do you feel that we're not good stewards of the watershed? I, I'm saying that you can't hide behind rules and regulations, a system and structure that was put in place a long time ago to be a good steward of the watershed now and show leadership. That's what I'm saying. And so if that means that you're taking that as you're not being a good leader, a watershed steward, then yes, I would say you're not being a good watershed steward because the watershed doesn't, doesn't start in 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 nid district and the bay delta plan is a perfect example of requiring all the tributaries to participate in the stewarding of the estuary and so if you're not participating as a leader in showing what you can do to help save the delta then that's not showing good leadership that's what i would say All right. Thank you, Michael. So getting back to the staff report, um, and I do want to, some near date, share our modeling of the 55% unimpaired flow. Um, we have a couple of slides to share today. Yes. Do we want to do that now? 
Maybe. I think that might help provide some context. So I've, some of the concerns? I've introduced this as it's really kind of risky for NID. It's risky for all water users, but in particular NID. So as the board's aware, we have the model that was completed for the plan for water process. We were able to run the unimpaired flow standard um, through the model. So that's able allows us to be able to take a look at potential impacts under climate change scenarios. As we all know, there's three climate change scenarios, including the model, essentially dry, uh, average, wet year scen hydrology scenarios. And then we also did some analysis without climate change, just what if we look backwards and apply unimpaired flows to a past period, what that would have looked like for the district. So I'll turn it over to Dustin so he can kind of walk you through some of these slides. Yeah, so just, just by way of further introduction, um, the, the modeling undertaken by the State Water Board does not include climate change hydrology. I, I think that is a huge mistake. That's unbelievable. <laughs> and that's we just, already did that. It's just not the reality we're facing, we did it. right? We did it. So one, one important piece, and, and Jen hit on this, but I want to emphasize it, is we have um, taken our model including the climate change hydrology, and then run a 55% of unimpaired flow mm -hmm. standard. Did we, and run, did we run all three? Um, did you say we ran all three uh, climate change? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so that's what the lines that, represent, colored lines. So this slide here, it's, it's an exceedance plot, which is like a probability. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the, I guess it would be a gray line on my screen. That's uh, existing, that's your basically existing condition. That's historic hydrology with your uh, recent demand. And what that shows is I'm looking at 20%. So about 20% of the time you've got roughly a 18,000 acre foot unmet demand. You see where the, the lines the cross. line crosses oh, at 20 On the gray line. Yeah. Um, the other three, the blue, the green, and the, what is that, a yellowish yeah. color, um, those are the climate change hydrology with a 55% unimpaired flow uh, standard. So you see the, the uh, unmet demand, the water supply impacts maybe is a different way to say it, is uh, more significant. So I would look at 50%. That, that's where my eye went when I first saw this. Um, about 50% of the time, you're going to see between a, about an 18,000 acre foot um, supply deficit up to about 37,000 acre feet. Um, that's that's annually. Um, obviously, in in dry sequences, it's more it's more significant. Um, uh, but you know, then you go to the 20%. So 20% of the time, currently, we have about an 18 18,000 acre foot. Uh, water supply impact, look at how that increases under climate change hydrology. It's between 40 and 60. It's more than double. So it's, it's very significant on an average annual um, basis. Next slide. Dustin, I, I just cannot, my jaw has hit the floor here in the, when you said the state did not figure into Two. their models climate change in, in, in modeling uh, unimpaired flows and how is that how did that happen I mean I just I just like I can't even find the word what was the statement the, it was too difficult too difficult yeah too hard. there is a kind of a <laughs> laughable statement in the staff report um, Holy smoke. Uh, but I I really think just just to put a finer point here was it last year or two years ago now uh, governor Newsom put out a his administration put out a document about uh, future looking water supply impacts and I, unfortunately I don't have the, the it's called the water plan um, yeah the, I, I, I'm gonna get this wrong but um, by 2050 basically there was something like seven to nine million acre feet of climate change impacts um, so it would be a reduction of that huge block of water uh, statewide due to climate change um, is that precipitation or is that available water? That's precipitation. Yeah, and this is this is a publicly available report. We can get it to you. We can link to it on our website. We've sent it out be. before, but yeah. we'll send it out again. Did our, did our climate change models show that 
reduction for us, if I remember the same, or? I don't know, the percentage, the, the like proportionally the same, but it yeah. obviously showed a huge percentage yeah. change. So the, the irritation to me is you have, you know, one arm of our state government, you know, kind of ringing the alarm bell here that, hey, we've got some future um, very significant water supply deficits that we're projecting as a result of climate change. Um, and yet, here we have a you know very significant proposal by the state water board to address these uh, concerning fishery conditions, and it doesn't integrate that same kind of thinking. So it's just it, there's a there's a schism in <laughs> state thinking here. Or deliver. Or maybe yeah, maybe it was. If it's going to undermine your priority, which they've made clear, they it's not all beneficial uses. It's one beneficial use. Then putting out data that would mm -hmm. compromise that position um, or, you know, make it evident the harm that this would cause is strategic. Yeah, I don't know. Also, take in mind the SACWAM model, I think it was first developed in 2011 and the last updated in 2016, so it is a fairly old model. So they're not, you know, they're using historical hydrology to inform the model and didn't include future potential climate change hydrology. I, I have a simple question. When when you explain this exceedance chart, it's Figure Ten. Yeah. Exceedance chart, um, and you speak about twenty thousand acres of uh, water that you have demand for and that you can't supply. What's actually the scope of your of your project? About one hundred twenty-eight thousand. Thank you. And I'm wondering, too, if you have the VA flow model so that we see the comparison between the VA and the UIF. We did not model the VA flow. The VAs are still being negotiated, and it's a little, um, you know, depending on which reach we go down, we just we didn't model we, we'll potential effects. We can speak to it, though. So, so this next slide, um, again, this is, this is our model using climate change hydrology. Um, this and, is historical hydrology. Uh, excuse me. Yep. Um, and historical hydrology, but using a, the unimpaired flow standard. Um, so it may be Chip can help me here, but I think of Scotts Flat as uh, almost all of your treated water system. I mean, certainly most, it's primarily it's most a of key it. wa for right, it's your key facility for Nevada County, yep. and a whole lot of your treated water system comes out of Scott's flat. Have a seat, Chip. And Have a seat. <laughs> to me, this uh, you've got two lines here. The blue line is actual conditions during a three-year drought period, actual storage at Scott's flat. And then the lower yellowish line is the, if you had implemented an unimpaired flow standard, what that would have done to During Scott's that same time period. During that same time period. And you're, you're dead fooled. You, I mean, obviously, in the real world, we would have been doing everything possible to make things work and keep toilets flushing and, and tap water running. But if you just run the model, it deadpools your facility. So, Chip, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, you, you accurately stated that it would definitely affect the drinking water supplies uh, if Scott's Flat is deadpooled like this. But even further than that, Scott's Flat is our main conduit for the raw water canals in right. all of Nevada County. Right. So basically Nevada County really suffers completely. The, the challenge with Scott's Flat, especially in an unimpaired flow scenario, is that Scott's Flat is artificially filled with import water. Um, it just does not have a big watershed. And so it heavily re relies upon those waters coming across from the Yuba River watershed and filling it. In an unimpaired flow regime, we have to keep those waters in the Yuba River watershed, send them down the river system, and we, we lose that opportunity to refill Scotts. And that is a critical piece of infrastructure for NID and without the ability to import, we're really struggling. So we may have other reservoirs that aren't as bad, Bowman, Jackson Meadows, maybe they're only at half, half full, but we can't get the water to Scotts, so we can't use it. So that's an additional challenge that we're running into in this scenario. So, so Nevada City usually runs out of their own water rights water about August 1st? Uh, usually much before that. So uh, 
they rely on spring runoff. Once that dries up, then they, they not come. So they rely on this water? Yes. And parts of Grass Valley, Lake Wildwood? All of the above. Everybody, Alta Sierra. And you're saying we would be dead pooled? Yes. Under the unimpaired flow? According to these models, yes. What you would end up doing is you would essentially have to cut off raw water deliveries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe go to the next slide. So this uh, this depicts by water year type and uh, incorporating both existing condition and the the, un the future uh, climate change hydrology. This is your st storage levels on April 30th. So you know as Chip does annually, sometime around you know March, early April, we're having a discussion about irrigation season and surplus water conditions and those types of things. So if, if you're looking at, I'm just look at like the dry unimpaired uh, graph. Um, you're even nearing Deadpool at April 30th in those extreme critical and critical dry years. So we don't even have water to start with. April 30th is usually your, your kind of high point of the year and you do all your planning for the irrigation season around that. Um, and you, you can't plan around, what is that, 2,000 acre feet? I mean, it's it, it, it's just a, it's like a Mad Max scenario. I don't even know how we would manage around that. It, it's a fundamentally different NID. We litigation is how we... Well, yeah, it, 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 this just tells me this is this is not implementable. It right. just does not work. Exactly. It, it, it work. breaks our system. Hey, Dustin, I have a question for you back on the last slide, the 90 and the 92. What was the purpose of that two-year? Just a dry three-year period the, three within year the drought. yeah. That was drought. okay. I just want to clarify that was. And yet the recent dry three-year period was the driest ever. It is the driest. We chose yep. the driest three-year period from the historical record. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. This was the driest, not the recent one. The recent one. The recent one was, but I don't believe they had the I, model. Yeah. Uh, well, they didn't have uh, yeah. The data in the model. Yeah. I. It, but it would be worse. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And that's one of also the challenges with the modeling that was completed for the basin plan update is that they look at averages, not multiple year drought periods. So again, this is April 30th. Would you go next slide? I, so one quick question on Scott's Flat. So Lake Wildwood would mimic Scott's Flat? As far as because they have a water right for 39, 3,980 acre feet. Uh, you're referencing their their reservoir in the subdivision there. Is that yeah. So they their water right would be for natural flows, and uh, essentially we'd be passing all natural flows, and they'd have the same obligation to pass to pass it on. Yeah. But so left, I should say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the prior slide was April 30th. Uh -huh. uh, this is now November 1st. So you're you're fast forwarding towards to the end of the irrigation season. Um, and you know, again, you're in many of the the years with climate hydrology, you just you've run out of water. So there is a an odd um, increase if you were to put them side by side. I'm looking at the the dry, 55% unimpaired, how the extreme critical actually went up. Um, and that's because in that model of future climate change hydrology, there's precipitation, there's there's odd precipitation coming in either you know late spring, early summer, or early fall, probably October. So that's why it, it comes up a little bit. Yeah, the precipitation shifts when compared to irrigation season. I think we just have one more slide, Chris. This is, uh, and Kian maybe can speak a little more to this. This is a, a depiction of impacts to uh, hydroelectric generation with, uh, remember with climate change hydrology, as Jen just mentioned, it's generally coming in earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, the, so the, the peak uh, precipitation events are and your, consequently, your pink, peak storage is shifting earlier. And uh, couple that with uh, unimpaired flow 
um, requirements, your generations shift in time, which I personally think is is um, extremely is it's an issue of statewide importance um, because as as we all know, um, we have uh, a energy system that is already susceptible to brownouts and blackouts, and at times is is on the ragged edge of that. Um, and you couple that with all of the, you know, emerging mandates for um, that will just exacerbate and increase the the load on the system. Um, and you you're really taking a key component, hydroelectric generation, and shifting it out of those key months when uh, energy demands are highest. And you may be generating in a negative market. And, you know, that, that happens, and Keen can speak to this better than I can, but a lot of times in those winter and early spring months, you're, there's enough power on the system, and, and to generate actually costs you money. Yeah, that's would, with a couple of our powerhouses. Yeah. Ian, is there anything you want to add to this? No, I think that, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a pretty dramatic impact is all you can say when you look at that, and it, and it will be felt throughout the state, right? This is just, isn't just our local um, problem. This is a statewide regional problem. So, hmm. so we've highlighted, uh, we're going to package this together. There's a larger report. Um, we're going to, uh, there's a January 19th comment deadline. Mm -hmm. We're going to submit, package this together and submit some comments. Um, and, you know, we've just touched the surface of some of the water supply and hydro generation. There are also impacts to recreation and terrestrial species, uh, temperature. Um, there are uh, concerns. My, personally, I'm very concerned about exacerbating uh, wildfire conditions mm -hmm. when you start drying out some of the current greenscape. Um, so we're going to package those comments and submit them by the 19th. Um, that will be available to the board and the public at that time. Um, in addition to that, we are uh, participating in discussions on um, voluntary agreements, healthy rivers agreements, um, as they're now called. And um, do you, do you want to introduce this, or would you like me to? Uh, go ahead. Okay. So um, we have we have already you know, obviously spent uh, many years, many meetings discussing new FERC license flows. So those are, you know, somewhat de defined and set upon issuance of a new FERC license. So what we were looking at is this interim period between now and when a new FERC license is issued, because our view at least is that those FERC license flows ought to govern they, they, it, whatever the, whether it's unimpaired flow or something else, that those should, should be our, those should be our, that's our standard. Yeah. yeah. But that standard comes upon issuance of a, of a FERC license, which you need a crystal ball to, right. to figure out when that will be issued. Um, so we're, we were focused on this interim period uh, between now and issuance of the new FERC license. Um, another dynamic is um, the folks that we are talking with, representatives, um, of various state agencies are very interested in new delta inflow and then that then becomes delta outflow. Uh, and they're targeting a certain season for that. And, you know, we get into a lot of complexities with NID because you, you have a lot of different routes, um, you know, Yuba system, Deer Creek, and so on, Fair River. Um, but there's a lot of people below you that you would have to work with and wheel water and there's complexity. Um, so after a lot of discussion, we honed in on a Bear River focus for a contribution to the Delta. We're uh, talking about um, about a 5,600 acre foot contribution. And an important point is it's not every year. It's in the year types that the, the state team has really focused on. Is that in addition to the uh, FERC? 
this is that interim period yeah. before the new FERC flows become. So this would be less than the FERC flows, but more than we are now. Correct. Okay. But once the FERC flows came into effect, the next, the they, would they would supersede. Okay. Yeah. There's, there's five water type years in the VA analysis, and they're only looking at the three middle, so the not the wettest and not the driest. Okay. And statistically, the three middle happen about 55 to 60 yeah. percent of the um, so it's not annually, but it'll happen more often than not. Um, so that's the, the Bear River contribution for Delta inflow, Delta outflow. Um, personally, what I'm actually excited about, and I, I hope it's something that we can do, is um, a, an Auburn Ravine contribution. It's redirecting. So the way your hydrology works is uh, Rollins Reservoir spills almost every year. And that's spilling down the Bear River, which is not the best habitat for fish. I, I hope I don't offend some people. But, um, however, Auburn Ravine, we think, can be very good habitat for fish. And obviously, we've already done a very uh, important and costly project to remove the hemp hill diversion. So um, the concept there is to redirect some of the spill water using um, Bear River Canal, dumping it in on, into Auburn Ravine at a, a strategic time in the spring to act as a, a flushing flow for any salmonids that are present in the system and you know, get them out of Auburn Ravine on their way to um, hopefully a healthier delta and, and before the irrigation season starts, when folks start drawing out of Auburn Ravine and have you know, impediments to passage and, and movement. So I'm, as I said, I'm personally um, excited about that opportunity. I think it would be very helpful to our local fishery. Um, and it's something that the state has um, reacted positively to. I, I'm talking in general to, to our VA concept um, they've reacted positively, but um, it's not a done deal yet. There's still some negotiation um, to be done. And then there's also a habitat component. So mm -hmm. part of our proposed habitat component right now, the baseline for habitats back to 2018, we have identified the Hempel project, and then we have also done some work to start analyzing whether it's or not it would be advantageous to salmon to remove Gold Hill diversion. Um, we also recently met with one of the fishery group on the Auburn Ravine um, and have started talking about how to proceed forward with a project of that nature. There's a lot of grant funding available, tons and tons of grant funding, but I think we've all come to terms with the best way to move forward is first to do an analysis to determine whether or not the natural obstacles will prevent fish from even getting there because we don't want to waste anybody's money. Um, so look forward to seeing some more information about that coming to the board in the future once we kind of get our plan laid out a little bit more. But the state board, or not the state board, and DWR and the other agencies did seem um, supportive of those habitat projects as well as continued meadow restoration. Who owns Gold Hill? We do. We do. Mm -hmm. About last meeting, we. Okay. We you? own Gold Hill. The last request came from SARSIS, which is the fishery organization um, that is concerned about salmon in Auburn Ravine. And um, we own Gold Hill. There's a little bit of miscommunication. They were filing for a grant to remove our infrastructure. So we have since Greg and I have the opportunity to go have a nice meeting with them. Um, it would be very difficult for a third party to do a construction project on our own infrastructure. So what we've been kind of tentatively talking about, and of course this is obviously board approval, is to, as I stated, do an analysis to determine whether or not the removal of Gold Hill would even be advantageous or not, if the fish can even get up there. If they can't get up there, there's really no reason to do it. But um, like I said, we'll bring something back to the board in probably a pretty short order to talk about it more. So my question is about to the um, idea of 5,000 acre feet yep. in the interim. I think you already stated that we can, we, we're, we, we can live with voluntary settlement or, or um, uh, FERC flow, we, we have the capacity to, to live with those, correct? The, well, the current in, so when we went through the plan for water modeling, the results that you saw did include the 
proposed right. in-stream right. flows and the reservoir operations right. model part. As you saw, there are some shortages. Mm -hmm. yeah. So y yes, there are some very significant shortages that are going to have somewhat of a gigantic financial impact to the district um, if we don't address them in some way or another. One of the things I have just gently talked about, I know this makes everybody nervous every time I break it, bring it up, but Aaron knows what's probably gonna come out of my mouth right now, is that if we can um, kind of go back to the table and just take another look at the wet year flows that we had committed to in the in the FERC relicensing negotiations, that, that might give us a little bit more carryover for the, those dry years that could really alleviate a lot of that pain. So as you know, the FERC relicensing process has been going on for, I don't know, a decade and a half at this point. Who knows where we're gonna land on this, um, but it is one concept we've been kind of chewing on a little bit. So I guess my question, then my question is, at this time we're just proposing, we would propose the 5,000 as the interim amount, would we? It's 5,500, but yes, 5,600. 5, okay. But <laughs> um, so we've talked about in the past uh, uh, petition and uh, on the, and the voluntary settlement idea that we already got the, the first flow is going to be this much. Do we talk about that now or just the? No, that was, that's also part of the VA proposal is that when our FERC license came out and was issued, that those in-stream flows would then basically take the place of the VA flows, and they are more than the 5,500, the, or 5,600. The 5,600 was, was identified from the initial VA ask from the state, so on a stem-by-stem -stem basis they identified how many acre feet they want from each one of those stems on a year type basis. So for the Yuba, and we're kind of weird because we could be in the Yuba or we could be on the feather. Mm -hmm. um, for the Yuba, it was about 60,000 acre feet in total. And YWA and some of their partners, their contribution is X. And then the 10,000 is the Delta and that's essentially what would be made up by South Sutter as well as NID. But you know, this is always a crapshoot because obviously this, uh, there's a lot of legal complexity to right, the A Delta right, update. Right. So I, you know, we could take bets on what goes into place first, whether it be the Bay Delta update or FERC license. Who knows? I don't know if I would bet on either one right now. Would it be fun to have a bet? Yeah, we'll have to think of some good odds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bowl grid. Like a, yeah, Super Bowl grid system. Okay. Karen has. So I understood that, I think you alluded to this, Gustin, that if you increase storage, that then it's, you don't get to keep the water because it's, I mean. Yeah, I. If you, could you even increase storage with this? I mean, it would be totally. And there's not an exact answer. Yeah, and I think. Chris alluded to this earlier with modular 6A. Um, well, first of all, if, if unimpaired flow is the standard, I don't know that you construct new above ground storage right. in California. You, you have unused storage with an unimpaired flow standard right. almost every year. So, yeah. um, so now, groundwater banking storage, absolutely, yeah. You would, you would be focusing on that. Um, but not above ground storage. I don't think it. I don't think it would ever pencil out. Right. So, um, but the the modular alternative that Chris uh, mentioned, um, basically, I I see it as a target of the tunnel project and sites reservoir. But it basically puts kind of a freeze and considers the system fully allocated. Yep. and um, doesn't allow any of these new diversions or, or points of rediversion. So, um, and you, you'll see comment on this regarding the um, 1927 permit that's sitting out there that's currently attached to the proposed Centennial Project. Um, there's a real question in my mind, what happens to that? that under, yeah, I was question. wondering about that too. The question is that. I, it, yeah. Under under modular 6A, it probably goes away, or it's, it's unusable, yeah. either practically or um, 
as, as a matter of law. Well, I think the other issue you're up against is any new storage project is going to require a new 401 certification, and they're going to make a huge water extraction through that process. Right, yeah, right. for sure. Right. So that, it further uh, diminishes. Yeah, diminishes the. You have a hundred thousand acre foot reservoir. They take fifty percent off the top. You know, right. you start getting. Right. Right. Well, Those are things we well, would have to consider. The cost benefit ratio of this. Yeah, I get it. So, so yep. Dustin, where does that hat land legally as far as water rights and, and where the state can they they state give us the state can take it away? How it's theirs right now. It's theirs to give. The state filed right yeah. was a creation of state law and it could be the state don't give it. Modified. So they don't yeah. have to they, we don't have they don't get we don't get a chance to uh to uh, litigate that one, right? I don't know. Well we may. Yeah. I mean it depends on what the act is to make it um, either taken away or no longer feasible to use. You can litigate anything. It just depends on whether it's smart to do or not. Yeah. So a um, next question is I would like to ask you to summarize our position that you'll be presenting mm -hmm. in your um, at our comments January at the January 19th comments. or whatever the deadline is. And I would like you to speak to the vulnerability that Chris referenced regarding the VAs being a temporary solution and that even if that's approved, that they would potentially pull the plug on that and then go back to their preferred solution. Yeah, that could, that's a valid yeah. statement. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so remind me of your second question because I'm going to answer your first one first. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, uh, th th there's still some internal discussion going on around this, but currently I, I view probably two or three comment letters, um, either by NID or on behalf of NID. So for example, one letter may, one comment may go out under my letterhead, mm -hmm. um, but it would be on behalf of NID. Um, but we're, we're commenting on a CEQA document, basically. Mm -hmm. So we want to encourage the Water Board to further analyze various aspects where we see deficiency. Um, there's a whole host of non sequa legal issues um, that we may or may not comment on at this time. This, by the way, this is not going to be the only bite at the apple. Um, January 19th is a kind of an interim deadline. In the springtime, the State Water Board has communicated they're going to release um, what's called a program of implementation. That's really the nuts and bolts of how they would implement either unimpaired flow or voluntary agreements. Um, it's really a, a lot of the detail that is lacking in, in this voluminous document. It's hard to imagine that it's lacking detail, but there are some really key outstanding issues in particular on how you would implement an unimpaired flow that just aren't here yet. Um, so that program of implementation will be released sometime this spring. There will be opportunity to review and comment on that and NID will participate, of course. Um, Can I, just before you leave that topic, I'm wondering if it would be helpful for NID's case to look to some of our NGO friends, <clears throat> look at some of our NGO friends uh, to uh, support our position. What, you know, if we can get additional letters to support our position, the fisheries, the you know, whoever, whoever we can get line up. Yeah, we've been, you know, we've been coordinating. Aaron and I, we actually just met yesterday. We met a few weeks ago. Um, I think that we're well aware of each other's positions, and to the degree they over or they cross, I think that that's a great thing. Obviously, you know, we we are on. We have two different obligations to our mission, right? Um, so there might be some diversions there, but we've also spoken with the county. So we are, right. yeah, we, um, you know, we've had some conversation. This has been a kind of a marathon race, and we're getting to the last bit of it. We're also heavily coordinating through NACWA and AQUA with larger regional groups on these comments and modeling, and there's a lot of pieces going on. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of contemplating maybe drafting up some type of comment letter to help with our other agency partners to Good. support the system. Because, you know, yeah, my, my experience, as limited as it is, but with those other larger agencies like AQUA, is that they're more Southern California focused mm -hmm. than us we who are up here at the headwaters are usually just kind of forgotten and that we really have to have a program of our own 
very strong advocacy and to bring in the county and, and the sorry and um, the NGOs to the extent that they can is probably more helpful than depending on a Southern California focus. Yeah, so NACWA is Northern California. I know. Yeah, I know. so we but mostly, primarily, it's kind of a hybrid group. It's kind of a conglomerate of impacted people. No, no, don't they represent an, a lot of agencies that have groundwater, which we don't? Um, so yeah, definitely some. Yeah, yeah definitely you know, some. I guess that's the one big difference I see is those of us who do not have versus those of them who do have groundwater. Right. So we participate in the NACWA and AQUA as members and also just as participating in the analysis. And then um, we will have our own letter and then... Uh, our partner agencies will have their letters, and then, as you've heard, you know, Circle and our other partners will have letters. And to the extent, um, you know, as Mr. Schutz stated, there is some agreement on kind of some of the out of county of origin diversions and mm -hmm. and how that's working. You know, one, and I'll go back to one of my big frustrations is if we were if the in-stream flows that were negotiated through the FERC relicensing process if they were conditioned so that Yuba couldn't use them in their baseline, that's a ton of new water going. Mm -hmm. But that's not what's happening. Yuba gets to essentially reuse them. Right. And through that reuse, they end up with more water, we end up with less. So that part's frustrating to me because that those negotiations, that water was for the environment, it wasn't to give Yuba more water. Um, so I think to the extent that we agree on those issues, mm -hmm. that they'll align. Okay. Yeah. I do think one final piece, there will probably be a discrete NID comment letter on the VA, mm -hmm. just as a, a placeholder. Mm -hmm. So, I, mm -hmm. you. Well, the, the second part was just, you know, the vulnerability that we have with the VAs that it, we might buy ourselves 16 years. It's not even 16, right? Yeah, so as currently framed, it's um, an eight year arrangement with a possible extension to 15 years. Um, in, in, I may get this wrong, but year six, so there's kind of a, an annual review of the VAs, and then there's a larger triannual review. Um, so year six is going to be more of a decision point for the State Water Board, where they've got six years of analysis and implementation of VAs, hopefully not just flow, but a host of new um, uh, habitat restoration type projects that are, have been done or in process. So year six will be a decision point, and it's structured as a red, yellow, green. Red light, VAs are not working. We're doing something else beginning year nine. Uh, yellow, they're working, they're worth extending, but there needs to be some tweaks. Green is, this is great, we're going to 15. Um, there is a, you know, a concern of mine, of mine as to, you know, what happens if it's red light? What does year nine look like? Mm -hmm. uh, or what happens at year 16 when 15 years have lapsed? Um, and, you know, we want to, I, I think the, when it really distill this is we want, whether it's after year eight or after year 15, we want the water board to re-go through this process. Um, whether it's a new voluntary agreement or whatever it's called at that point in time, or whether it's some, you know, emerging different perspective about how to address whatever the concerns are with the various beneficial uses, that there's a robust process, much like what we're doing right now, where there's opportunity for review of the proposal, environmental analysis, public comment, and so on. That, that to me, is an essential component of whatever we're happens at that off-ramp. Yeah. Do we have confidence that the water, this environmental water, water that's proposed through the unimpaired flow regime is actually going 100% to the environment, that it's not being shipped down? <laughs> <laughs> um, or, I mean, no. or diverted in between yeah. here and the Golden Gate? Right. Uh, the answer is no. no. Yeah. Um, I know it's well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's concerning because yeah. if you put a big facade across something that really you're you're solving a different issue in part at least, then we're going to get to red light in the VAs right. because they keep, they keep diverting. Yeah. And I think I don't know how we shine a light on that, but uh, uh, it, it 
It's an acknowledged issue. Both it's a flow accounting problem and it's a flow protection problem. Very extremely technical and legal issues that need to be addressed. But they, at least at this point, it is acknowledged that those are issues that need to be addressed. A lot of that is stated to be addressed during the implementation plan portion, but you know we haven't seen that yet. Right, and and by then you've already picked the solution, right? I mean. No, they well model a couple of them. They'll have the pro the project scope. We, we think they'll have a preferred yeah. project by then. By the time they release the draft program of implementation, oh. I, I should have mentioned this earlier, but there is not a proposed project. There's just a suite of alternatives. Right, right. exactly. Right. But when you get to the implementation, you're talking about implementing a project. That's the preferred project. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. that's the expectation. Okay. <coughs> mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions? Trevor, really Chris? Instructive. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to comment about, thank you, Dustin. This is, when I saw this, I go, woohoo, this is like, <laughs> for the, for the uh, lay person, the former, uh, this is really good. And it's like, digested <clears throat> down well. Yeah. So. And I appreciate, Aaron, you being here today. Exactly. Yeah, me too. Adding that, adding for me, a lot of Yeah, Aaron's been great to work with at Circle. Although, we, like I stated, sometimes we, are in opposition to our positions, we're still able to find a way to work together and complement them. At the end of the day, we all want the same thing. A healthy watershed, fish, abundant water, for drinking the environment. I mean, you know, we all want the same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. And also, um, good direction. I'm wondering what the headline tomorrow should be. Um, should it be 55% unpaired flows go in and while water deliveries to Nevada County get shut off? No. <laughs> but that's what that's what we were looking at. Well, we wouldn't have it out of Scott's flat and we couldn't transfer it in. Or should the uh, headline be that uh, our out of district customers um, will be on perpetual shortage and rationing? I don't know that I, why don't we, Premature. yeah, why don't we do the comment letter first and then yeah. kind of try to. I just want to put out there that, but formulate something. both those scenarios were, were talked about today as possibilities if the state does go 55% on impaired flows as our modeling shows for Scotts Flat Reservoir. And those are both heavies. Well, and I, I take from Rich's comment the importance of incrementally introducing our community to this issue so that it's not, oh, whoa, surprise, everybody, it's a done deal, right. that we're being strong advocates for our interests, that we're working with our community partners on trying mm -hmm. to find solutions. Yep. And that is, so anyway, that, I think that's what I took from your comment is yeah. that we, that's I, I, yeah. I appreciate that clarification because that's exactly it. We are working our partners and to find a solution that works for our community. But I guess what what I want to ask you is, um, Rich, what I heard was that you have some intention of sort of saying, you know, here's the worst case scenario, and by the way, this is being talked about, it's sort of like red light, red light, red light, as opposed to waiting until we get more information. I mean, I don't want to say the sky is falling. No, no, but we have the modeling. Well, and well, also note that well, the, but that's I agree with a you, different, but, yeah, that's a different think, answer then. Yeah, I'm just saying, what would the headline be tomorrow? Uh, there, will there, there would be a headline. I don't think tomorrow. there will be one. I think that's ID. the point. That's we, an alternative headline for you. Oh, good. The headline is something like, you know, Circle and NID are working together there you to go. find something for the, ball, you know, in Chapter 5. In the county. In the patient section, 5-4. One, one or something like that, and then it goes on. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole opportunity, Chris Schutz was talking about, it, right. voluntary implementation where you take all of the different levers that we have to find something that works for the watershed and the agency. And it'll be different for the feather, it'll be different for the upper sack, it's different for the sample. And it's gonna be different for us, especially for how much water we move between basins. And mm -hmm. so I would suggest that the headline is that we are, we have, we the proposed VAs, we see the state board's recommendation, and we're going to find something in the middle that works for us. And, and that is a perfect headline. Very good. Thank you. Because uh, I just want to, you know, 
So, so I, I will also mention that we do have an opportunity here to educate our community mm -hmm. on the issues at hand. We have comment letters. Clearly, we're working with Circle on the things that work well together with us. Um, we're we're planning and preparing a series of educational opportunities for the community, Good. website based, social media based. I mean, it's this is something that we all have to understand. I have some, some questions. Um, first, just to just educate myself, and with that, with that our, our little water district, and with that, other other uh, public. Um, I wrote them down yesterday, so some of them have been already answered more or less. But what I, what I want to have a minute or so answers to is how do you see your hydro project imparted from on the parish floor? And with that, how do you see your uh, finances uh, impacted so that you can deliver your water? Yeah, the, so that last slide we showed showed the impacts to the hydropower generation, and um, from there, and that will be part of our comment letter. We will cost that out on an annual basis. That some people not only have reduced hydropower revenue, but we would also have reduced revenue from water sales. So what that translates to is water rates would have to go sky high because the system is still the same size. Right, because you can't do both. Yeah. Right. You either have less customers or, you know, sure. either or, which way. For South Feather, North Yuba, I don't see no net revenue. That's it would be a rare event. Right. Right. That's, a, that's, what we're, that's why I'm asking these questions. Yeah. yeah. Right. And um, so you're planning to do public comments by, by the, the January 19 letter. Did you, did you guys also go to the, to the state hearings? Mm -hmm. Uh, which day did you go? So we participated in person. I don't remember which day. There's three days of hearing, one, okay. and then um, we also listened. On, you could participate via online. Okay. So then, okay. So then uh, we could we could as public we could take a look at at what you presented. So we didn't present as part of a specific panel. There's panels presented that represented us. Yeah. Okay. Great. And. Have you guys already signed on to PAs, or are you in in process? We're still in negotiations. So you're not on the MOU. This we are not currently on the MOU. And I'm excited to hear you, you answered one question. Are you working together with the other water water agencies district to coordinate your response? It sounds like you are. Yes. And which which are the ones? I mean, of course, you have a lot of. Um, you would probably participate in Aqua, wouldn't you? With the uh, with Yuba because you yeah. have that you have that watershed sharing. Um, do, you have, do you have coordination with with colleagues down the line? Yes. There's a lot of different coalitions. I mean, obviously, this is such a important yeah. big topic. There's a lot of different coalitions. Um, obviously, there's a there's a water um, water agency coalition. That's more of an Aqua and an Aqua type. Um, organization, but it, it really spans North Adult. You know, the typical um, divisions that we see in California, north to south or ag to urban, those divisions aren't present when it comes to um, viewing VAs as a preferred approach to this topic. Um, so that's one coalition. I've heard mention of um, some of the, you know, kind of business interests. Um, since there are corresponding economic effects when you start changing a you know the the flow regime to such an extent under under unimpaired flow, so there's some um, more of a business type um, coalition forming that again I heard I'm not directly participating in that, but um, I think you're going to see a whole lot of comments from all different types of perspectives and coalitions and. Um, the water board's going to have to wade through all of those and make revisions to their document, respond to those comments. So it'll be a lengthy process. It's kind of kind of exciting, right? To see everybody. What, <laughs> what, what I'm what I'm trying to to see, and what I hope to see, is that a crisis like the fish, a crisis that is so you know so terrible, will bring not only the the, the fishery advocates together, 
but um, it brings also all the all the water agencies and districts together. So we we create more of a, um, more of a us all all together trying to solve problems and be um, committed to reasonable use and also beneficial use for this that and the other. We all have so much at stake. So that's kind of nice to see you guys go there. Thank you. All right. So, any more comments from the audience? Any more director comments? Just to say thank you so much for the effort that you've been putting okay. into this. Yep. I really feel in good hands with your leadership. Yeah, it, it's um, commendable. Thank you. All right. So, go to general manager's report. General, right? No. Um, no. General, general manager. Manager. So I will make it quick. Um, I just wanted to inform the board we have a member of the community, this is maybe kind of exciting, approach the district about naming one of our small, tiny reservoirs um, up by Island Lake. So historically, you know, Island Lake is very small and it has a little baby lake next to it. And we nice consider little, both of nice those islands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a little tiny baby. Mm -hmm. um, it's always been also called Island Lake or Baby Island Lake, which I just named it, and she would like to name it Hoot Lake. So, oh, like a hoot trail, like a hoot owl, like a great owl, like a yeah, a great owl, horn, great horned owl, a hoot owl, hoot owl lake, hoot owl lake, hoot nanny. I don't know what hoot nanny means, but I don't know that we should name it like that. There's a local man named Hoot. Oh, okay. Um, so we will be bringing that forward to the board just for consideration. I thought that's something the board should weigh in on, naming one of our facilities. So look forward to that, unless there's any big objection to me. Big, does that open a big floodgate where the next somebody else will come and well, we possibly want Island Lake? It, so it com could wanna, completely do that. I don't know. Oh, yeah, it's oh, it's it's incredible. It's, it's right next to Hoot Lake. Right. <laughs> Not Hoot Nanny Lake. Lake. Big Lake is it next to Car Feely. Car Feely. Oh, okay. You know you drive up. I've been there. Yeah. Island Lake. You probably saw. It. <laughs> do you need more, we do need better parking. <laughs> no, no. No, we don't. This is a can of worms. Uh, no. So we will bring that forward. Um, we're going to do a quick water supply update, Chip is, and then just as everybody knows, the administrative hearing office status update meeting is March 6th. Huh. Okay. Yeah. I just I remind everybody again. And we did, the water supply update is not really exciting because you know, we haven't had a whole lot of presentations. Mm -hmm. But we thought we'd kick off I just want to know what the beginning the of the year. Long range outlook. Are we going to be drought? Or I don't know. Weather. Yeah, I think it's a toss up. A little too early to tell. Okay. But we'll, we'll blow through this real quick. So if we can go to the next slide, please, Chris. Uh, this is our precip. Uh, to date, actually, as of the 3rd of January. So our reports oh. come in on Thursday, so we'll get the update tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But as of right now, we're about 72% of average. That relates to about 8 inches of rain behind. So, yeah, we're behind. It seems like it's been raining nonstop, but they just haven't been big storms. Yeah. So mm -hmm. hopefully that will change in the near future, and we are better than we were in 2020. So well, I'll hang my hat on that. It is cold. We are getting snow. Yeah. Our first snow survey won't come until the beginning of next month, and following the results of that, I anticipate we'll be back to the board with a water supply update and maybe a classification for the coming irrigation season, mm -hmm. so more to come. Next slide. Uh, this is the bright part of our water supply portfolio, is that 198,000 acre feet for this time of year. That's a ton of water. It's gone up. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it can we started start. really high. Yeah. yeah. started high. No Carried over right the skit. Good shape. So 107% of our 10-year average for this time of year. That looks really good. So the winter water is now all rainfall flows? Uh, for the most part. I think there may be a few reaches down below where we're still diverting a, a little bit, but obviously we're making ground, so that's excellent. You'd say the, the crossover point here between 22 and, tw and 23 is showing that we're behind last year's rainfall? Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Next slide. So the, this is the same news for basically across the state. So precip across the state I think is below average, but the reservoirs still remain better than average due to such a robust year we had last year. 
these numbers are really hard to read because they're so small, but basically most everybody is above 100%. And the next slides kind of detail where we're at in Northern California here. For instance, here's Lake Shasta, and you can see it remains above average. It has made the turn and started filling as, filling as well. Um, but again, not a lot of big storms yet. Hopefully that will change. Next slide. Trinity actually is making some ground. This is, I don't understand the operations of this reservoir. <laughs> it, it, so why do we always, what is this? There is, well, it's, it's a key piece of the CVP, um, you know, Shasta River operations. Yeah. But the reason it's, so this is predominantly a snow-fed mm -hmm. watershed that's receiving precipitation. So that's why it's the uptick there. It's, and, it's falling as rain that manifests as inflow to the uh, reservoir rather than snow. You, so you actually kind of don't want to see that. Just, positive. Yeah. Well, uh, it, you know, I anticipated it would it would skyrocket during last year's snow melt. Unfortunately, it didn't. And I assume that's because they used it as a reservoir to for temperature control they, balancing. They did not have a good water year last year. Just a lot of just didn't have the a lot of the storms just kind of missed them. Missed them. Yeah. That's a big reservoir. We had a great year. They did not. Next slide. Lake Oroville, same situation, uh, well above average, making the turn. This probably will just slow down if we continue to get snow instead of rain. It, it will creep up. Um, a rain on snow event will make it jump, but this is where we're at for now. Still pretty good news. Folsom, there you go. It's pretty good, just flat lining at the moment, waiting for a good storm. Bowler's Bar, same situation there. And next slide. The eight to 14 day temperature outlook. So we've been really cold. Uh, obviously we had a little bit of snow, but uh, that looks to change in the next coming weeks. Um, okay. Back to above average. Next slide. And precip continues to predict above average rainfall, which is good. We'll cross our fingers for that. Next slide. That was eight to 14 day. This is seasonal. So this is for three months, February, March, and April. The long-term predictions show that there's temperature outlook uh, remains above normal, which is what you'd expect in an El Nino year. Next slide. Um, and then precip, we're kind of on that edge of average to above average, um, but time will tell. Next that's slide. That's El Nino South. Yeah, that's typical El Nino pattern. Yep. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, the drought monitor for California really hasn't changed in months. Uh, looks pretty good. Um, no major changes. North and south, a couple little dry spots, but nothing major. Next slide. And then the drought monitor for the entire United States actually is continuing to improve. Pockets of drought here and there, but look at the West Coast, looks like in really good shape for now. Um, treated water usage across the district for all of 23 was 6% less than our 11 year average. So we really didn't ask for uh, major conservation however we got it because of all the rain a lot of that can be contributed to the weather yeah. so but regardless um we like to think that we we uh, emphasize smart water use and that helps but uh anyway there's your numbers for the year of 23 and there you go um, thank you uh, you mentioned el nino and i've been fascinated by this since that word that term first came out is it your opinion that the fluctuation is more temperature or more precipitation so the El Nino itself is a fluctua is a raising of the temperature of the ocean on the Pacific. Yeah. But how that affects our... So where we're at locationally, they'll tell you we can either receive more or less. Right. Usually, yeah. typically in Southern California, they receive more. Northern areas, a little... Precipitation. Of precipitation. Some of our wettest years have been in El Nino. Yes, yeah, right. but also some dry ones. Yeah. <laughs> the temperature, temperature part... Was my bigger question. So El Nino is generally a warmer type year. Uh, La Nina is usually colder. Oh, okay. So thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Or weather man. <laughs> I have to play one on TV. That's about it. Any other questions? Chip. All right. Thank you. Yes, All right. Board of Directors, items, reports. Uh. The only thing I'll report is uh, Congressman Kevin Kiley married uh, Chelsea Gardner, which you hadn't heard, at the last, I guess, the sure. 30th of December. So I attended their reception at the beautiful flower farm down in Tassar County. And I uh, just want to say congrats and wish them the best of luck. And I attended the Placer County Farm Bureau meeting with Greg, and he did a great update. And 
it's very nice to be welcomed back to that organization because we were told not to show up. Really? I don't know. Told. A little while. <laughs> well, anyway, um, I also uh, I send out a newsletter to my stakeholder group, so I thought it was really interesting. I had a 60% open rate, and I had about a an 8% click-through rate. So I do all the links to uh, NID website information, mm -hmm. and that got me looking at our website again. And I just have to, again, commend Susan and Greg for the – I, I just think the changes that you have implemented in that area, I think – because we're on the board, we're not always looking at that website, but I, I think you have made profound improvement in our website and accessibility of information, the clarity of how you can search things. And anyway, I, I just say kudos to all of you for that work. Good. Susan. All right, she goes. She was she, Ricky. Uh, no report, Christmas, New Year's, you know. <laughs> and Reuben. And, yeah, and grandbaby. Right. Uh, you know what Ricky just said. <laughs> right. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everybody. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wait. And one last thing. Congratulations, mm. President Johansson. Yes. Mm. And I had your oranges, and they are superb. I'm meaning two or three a day. <laughs> That's my report. So in the pickup, for whoever gets our first in the back, there's some big ones. Okay. Ooh. Oranges. And they're even I'm juicier. Race. They could be already gone. Truck's been out there a while. That's true. Yeah. Our crew, huh? Um, Nothing for me. Public comments on items to be considered in closed session. And Mr. President, I do not rec uh, uh, believe there will be any reportable action taken in closed session. Yeah. So. Okay. So open session is now closed. <laughs>